Hello everybody and welcome to Nutrition 101. Today we're going to start off by introducing the subject of nutrition and talk about the language that we use to discuss nutrition and the various reasons and impacts that it might have on your life. Nutrition is in a, a collection of applied sciences. It's not just one specific thing. It includes chemistry because nutrients are all chemical compounds that are found in our food and in our bodies. And it is also biology because we talk about anatomy and physiology and the ways that our body digests and absorbs these nutrients and turns them into usable material. It is also an agricultural science um, because it encompasses the concepts of farming and plant physiology like botany. And it's a food science because it takes specific considerations to determine the types of nutrition that's available from foods and also ways to prepare food that maximize the nutritional potential of it. So when we talk about nutrition, we talk about six different nutrient categories. There are the major nutrients, which encompass carbohydrates, protein, lipids, which are also known as fats, and water. And then there are the minor nutrients, which are vitamins and minerals. And they're called minor nutrients because you need smaller quantities of them, not because they're less important. There are also, so there's a distinguishing distinction between caloric and non-caloric nutrients. Um, carbohydrates, protein, and fats are caloric nutrients, meaning they contain calories, and vitamins, minerals, and water are do not contain calories, but are nevertheless just as essential. And the caloric nutrients have different amounts of energy available from them. So carbohydrates and proteins each have four kilocalories per gram and fats have nine kilocalories per gram. This is why you sometimes hear that fat it has, it has more calories than protein or carbohydrates because it contains more per gram than those nutrients. And Different things in nature are composed of different amounts of these various nutrients. Most things are mostly water. So here you see a diagram that shows the relative amounts of various nutrients present in a ear of corn and in a human being. So both the ear of corn and the human being are more than 50% water. But a ear of corn, the next most abundant nutrient in it is carbohydrates indicated by the brown circles and then a little bit less than that is protein and fat and then even less than that is minerals and further less is vitamins now a person or any animal really is composed primarily of water and fat and followed by protein and carbohydrates so we have a lot more fat in us than vegetables do, for instance, but we have a decent amount of carbohydrates and protein because carbohydrates are the fuel for physiological processes. Now, there are some nutrients which we call essential nutrients because they are not made by the body or not made rapidly enough by the body to avoid deficiency without consuming them in food. Now sometimes these the essentiality of these nutrients might be debatable. For example, it, vitamin D is something that is made naturally on our skin due to the reaction of cholesterol with UV rays from sunlight. But in higher latitude regions closer to the North and South Pole, the amount of UV radiation available in the wintertime is too low to provide us with enough vitamin D, and therefore we might need to take supplementation from foods or from dietary supplements. 
Now, there are, is a difference between organic and inorganic nutrients. In this case, organic means carbon-containing, and specifically carbon and hydrogen-containing, which these are typically large molecules containing, containing carbon bonded to hydrogen, like fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. Also vitamins but not, and alcohol, but not minerals or water. Minerals are inorganic, and so is water. Now, you might ask yourself, why even bother studying nutrition? Although, if you're signed up for this class, you're probably not asking yourself that question. Malnutrition is still a large issue throughout the world and in the United States, especially in, in areas where income levels are low and availability of fresh food is low. However, this type of malnutrition that we see is a lot different than it used to be. Um, back in the 30s, people used to die from vitamin deficiencies like pellagra, which is vitamin B3 deficiency. People died from vitamin D deficiency, which hurts your ability to absorb calcium. And also thiamine, which is another vitamin, B vitamin, and, and scurvy were, defic were prevalent because we didn't know yet how to get some of these nutrients or that they were even necessary to get. Um, another thing that happened a lot more, but it's still happening today, is starvation. So the lack of enough calories in the diet, and this can take a number of different forms, which we'll discuss. But um, nowadays, we have a bigger issue in a lot of the developed world. We still have starvation and nutrient deficiencies in the developing world. In the developed world, we have obesity epidemics, where we have for instance, in the year 2008, 64% of U.S. adults were overweight and 30% met the definition of obesity. However, despite this, we have had borderline nutritional deficiencies and diseases preventable with proper diet. So we have plenty of calories available, but we're not necessarily getting what we need in the regards to vitamins and minerals or even protein sometimes. And we know that obesity is one of the primary causes of heart disease and diabetes and gastrointestinal issues. So, obesity increases the risk for heart disease, diabetes, and certain cancers. And specifically, fat around the waist, or what's known as visceral fat, is considered to be the most dangerous when fat collects around the waist it starts to release hormones into your body that cause you to ex experience physiological stress and metabolic instability uh, there's a guideline that's used in the nutrition community that your waist measurement should be no more than half of your height in inches so if you're 64 inches tall your waist measurement should not exceed 32 inches now that's um not a hard and fast rule, especially for people who are maybe on the slimmer or thicker side of the frame discussion, but for the average person, this is the case. And this is a fun flow chart to show you all the ways that obesity will mess up your life. So obesity is a known risk factor for some cancers and for gallbladder disease. It's also a risk factor for diabetes, which is sort of a feedback loop. You become obese and puts you at risk for diabetes. Diabetes disrupts your metabolic system, which causes you probably to gain more weight, which just reinforces this feedback loop. Uh, atherosclerosis is the buildup of plaque on the artery walls, and this can lead to high blood pressure, it can lead to stroke and heart attack, and it can be caused by both obesity and diabetes. And hypertension can create a feedback loop with atherosclerosis too, where your high blood pressure is higher, so it creates more plaque, which increases your risk for stroke and heart attack. Now, there was a study done in Sweden where they followed 20,000 men for a decade to try to ascertain behaviors that might reduce the risk of heart attack and by how much. And um, this study was published in the American College of Cardiology. They found the top two factors were 
cessation of smoking, which was a 30% reduction in heart attack risk. And then second was healthy eating, which was an 18% reduction in heart attack risk. Um, now, in addition, a de decreasing waist size, which is a, a rigorous loss of body fat, in addition to eating healthy, led to a further 12% decrease in heart attack risk. So you can, it is possible to eat healthy and still remain overweight if you don't, if you over consume calories or don't get enough exercise. However, if you exercise and lose weight, then you will reduce your risk of heart attack even further. And then if you are a heavy drinker and you reduce this alcohol consumption to a reasonable amount, then that can reduce your risk of heart attack by as much as 11%. Exercise didn't decrease it as much as you might think three, with a 3% reduction, but um, it makes more sense that losing weight would help reduce it because having more body fat tends to lead to more deposition of plaque on the interior of your arteries. So we're going to talk a lot about in this class what makes a food a good choice. When you compare the amount of calories in it to the amount of other nutrients that you're getting, it gives you an idea of something called the nutrient density. Now, the amount of calories that you need in a day might fluctuate based on your activity level or the way that you prepare your food. And the amount that you consume, because some people, if you eat large amounts of food, it will be absorbed less efficiently by your body and you might, in fact, feel hungrier even on a full stomach. Uh, nutrient density, it's important to try to get as many different types of nutrients every time you eat to make sure that you're getting everything you need in a day. Uh, and it's also important to take account of things that are non-nutrient components of a diet like fiber or probiotics or phytochemicals or antioxidants which might significantly help maintaining a healthy lifestyle that are not necessarily uh, a nutritious component so nutrient density is a measure of the number and quantity of nutrients provided per kilocalorie of of energy in a food an example of this is the comparison of white rice versus brown rice. White rice is, has been bleached, meaning that it has lost a large number of vitamins and minerals that were naturally inside of it in an attempt to also remove microbial species. Brown rice has all of those still in it, and so it is a more nutrient-dense food. Another example of differences in nutrient density is the difference between skim milk and milk with fat in it. Skim milk has less calories and less fat in it, especially less saturated fat than fatted milk. However, it may not be as nutrient dense because milk with fat in it has more fat soluble vitamins and minerals in it, which tend to be more bioavailable to the human body. So it, you might find that low-fat milk or full-fat milk, despite having more calories and more saturated fat, has more nutrient density depending on your nutrient needs. So if, obviously if you're overweight and in your middle adulthood, you don't need necessarily as much fat from your milk as, say, a growing child might. But you still need vitamin A and vitamin D, which are both fat-soluble vitamins. So it might make sense, instead of going with skim milk and only getting protein and carbohydrates, having a little bit of fat in your milk and just cutting fat out in a different place where it's less nutrient-dense, like a fried food of some kind. So in this class, we're going to see a lot of things that are listed as kilocalories or more calories. In the context of nutrition labeling, a kilocalorie is the same as a calorie, even though a kilocalorie is 
actually a thousand calories. Um, this is due to, I assume, simplicity of labeling. We generally use a large C or an uppercase C on calorie to indicate that it is a kilocalorie. And just rem just remember that we are actually always talking about kilocalories. So, and the calorie listings on food labels refer to kilocalories. So, something that has 100 calories on a nutrition facts label has 100 kilocalories of energy. And the unit of energy is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water one degree Celsius. And this, basically what they what they do to determine this is they metabolize or oxidize using chemicals or flame the food in question and measure the amount that it heats water by. And that's how they determine how much energy is in a food. So once again, Carbohydrates have four kilocalories per gram. Protein has four kilocalories per gram. Fat has nine kilocalories per gram. And alcohol has seven kilocalories per gram. These are important numbers to remember. They're going to appear again and again in this course as we discuss the various content of foods and specific ways to calculate what is in, say, a dish that you prepare at home. So we're going to hear, do an example here. Say your lunch has 1,500 kilocalories of energy in it. You also know that it has 45 grams of fat, 228 grams of carbohydrates, and you don't know how many grams of protein. You can calculate the grams of protein and the percent of protein based on your knowledge of the number of calories in the meal and the number of calories per gram of fat, carbohydrate, and protein. Now we're going to do this example together. Calories from protein is determined by subtracting the calories from fat and calories from carbohydrates from 1,500. So we start with 1,500 kilocalories. We subtract 45 grams of fat times 9 kilocalories per gram and minus 228 grams of carbohydrates times four kilocalories per gram. And this leaves us with 183 calories left over to be, to come from protein. Then with those calories from protein, we can calculate the grams of protein in the food by dividing 183 kilocalories by four kilocalories per gram. This gives us 45.75, which we round up to 46 grams of protein. And then to find the percent of protein, we divide the calories from protein by the total calories and multiply it by 100, which gives us 12% protein, 12% cal calories from protein in this food. So a summary of this process, if you're trying to convert from grams to calories, you multiply by, you multiply by the factor uh, four or nine calories per gram. When you're converting from calories to grams, you divide by the factor. So we did both of those things in that problem. And then to find a percent, you divide the part by the whole. So if you know that there are 450 calories from fat and there's the total of 2,400 calories, you divide 450 by 2,400. So there are a number of factors that affect the nutrient needs of individuals, and we'll talk about all these throughout the, the course um, in a number of different orders. But the main one is age, but also sex, level of physical activity, sometimes genetic factors, and also something called epigenetic factors, which is related to the way that your endocrine system triggers the replication of your DNA during development and can be affected by lifestyle choices of both you and your parents, which may have unforeseen consequences in your 
nutritional life. Now, when you're trying to decide what to eat, it's important to remember that you're trying to eat to live. You don't want to center your whole lifestyle around eating. Um, so food is fuel for life. So figuring out what you need to eat to do the things that you want to do is an important part of it. But in general, you want to have a diet that consists of a large variety of nutrition, uh, a large variety of nutrient dense foods. You want to prepare those foods to retain the most nutrients possible. You want them to be fresh. You want them to be a peak ripeness and taste so that you are motivated to eat them. And an, in general, if you eat foods that are of a wide variety of colors, you will be reasonably certain to get a diverse palette of vitamins and minerals, which will give you reasonable assurance that you are getting enough of everything. Another way that you can do this is by eating at least five fruits and vegetables each day, which gives you a wide variety of vitamins and minerals. If you want to know more, you can follow this link to um, a download from the FDA website. And this is a discussion of the nutrition facts labels and maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Um, I have it open here on the computer, so I will show you this. So it has a discussion of how to use the nutrition facts label and how to read it. And we'll go through that in this lecture as well. Um, it also has a section on action steps for a healthy diet. It tells you how to consume various food types like fruits, vegetables, grains, dairy, and protein. It also talks about fat, saturated fat, sodium, and sugars, and the ways that you should try to reduce these things in your diet. And it also gives you preparation tips for various types of foods and the ways that you can maximize the nutritional potential of your meals. I've linked to this. I've, I've posted this PDF on the Blackboard under the content tab. And you can see here I've posted a number of other things. Um, there are a couple of publications of the food FDA and also of the National Institute of Health, which we'll talk about later. So we're going to run into, in this class, a lot of information, and you may find yourself questioning its reliability, or you may yourself find some information about nutrition that causes you to question whether or not it's reliable. In general... The people that you want to trust for nutrition information are registered dietitians or nutritionists. A registered dietitian is somebody who is licensed by the state of New York to assist people in achieving a healthy lifestyle via dietary change. A nutritionist is someone who has degrees in nutrition-related fields, but is not as highly specified as a dietitian. In general, MDs don't have a ton of nutrition training unless they have focused on it themselves optionally because it's not really required as part of a medical doctorate program. Nutrition journals generally have good scientific research methods that they've employed in their papers and you can trust those sources. Um, you don't want to really trust some blogger unless they're posting links to peer-reviewed studies. There are a number of good resources on the FDA website. I've linked here to a number of educational resource materials from them. The National, National Institute of Health also has a lot of good information, and from time to time throughout the semester I will be posting publications from these two institutions that will uh, supplement the material that I discuss in the PowerPoints. And just real quickly, I'll show you these websites. So this is the FDA Nutrition Education Resources and Materials page, which I've linked to from the content section of Blackboard. Um, actually, I didn't link to it, but I will. 
and this has a number of information on things like the nutrition facts label. There's another, there's a new nutrition facts label that's been, that's just come out recently and they've changed a couple of things about it. And we'll talk about that. They also have resources for educators and for youth about just various ways to motivate people to try to live healthy lifestyles because it's a major part of thriving in your life and in your community. Um, so that's that. The National Institute of Health website has an education and awareness section. And this is more focused on, on public health initiatives like heart health or lung health. They also have blood health and sleep health, but then they have things like the Healthy Weight Initiative for adults and the um, children's nutrition program called We Can, and then something called the Community Health Worker Health Disparities Initiative, which is an agency that's helping to resolve disparities in underserved communities. A lot of modern nutritional initiative revolves around helping at-risk communities exist on the same level as communities that are not at risk. And a lot of that just involves education and also providing places for people to get healthier food, which is sometimes a not non-trivial situation. So, we're going to talk now about nutrition facts labeling. And nutrition facts labels are comprised of mandatory and voluntary nutrient components. There are a number of things that are required by the FDA to be on a nutrition facts label, and sometimes companies will include additional components in order to either promote the health, the healthiness of their product, or for other reasons, um... But generally, the nutrients that are presented are selected because they address today's public health concerns. And the order that they're presented in reflects the relative priority of the current gui dietary guidelines. Now, oftentimes, health claims will be made on packaging for food. You might see a cereal that is high in whole grains, and it'll say that it uh, promotes good heart health because the FDA recommends consumption of a certain number of whole grains every day so that you get enough f soluble and insoluble fiber to reduce the amount of fats in your blood. Now, companies can't make those types of claims unless they are based on peer-reviewed research, which is why a lot of times you'll see things on um, products that say this statement has not been evaluated by the FDA. They have to say that so that they can't pretend like they have come up with some magical cure for cancer. So the mandatory items on a nutrition fact label are shown here. You have to show the number of calories and as well as the calories from fat because it's been found that diets that have a high percentage of calories from fat tend to be at higher risk for heart disease, which is the number one killer of people in the United States. Then the total fat content, as well as the saturated con fat content, because it's been found that saturated fat consumption has been linked to heart disease. Additionally, trans fats now have to be shown on labels because they are so egregiously bad for you, you really shouldn't get any in your diet. Cholesterol, too, is the is a compound that's found in animal sourced foods that contributes to plaque buildup on the interior of your arteries. Uh, over sodium is both essential for proper fluid balance in your body, but also a culprit in high blood pressure because getting too much sodium disrupts your fluid balance and makes your blood pressure rise. Carbohydrates are another very important nutrient because without enough carbohydrates you can't get enough energy to move your body and if you get too many carbohydrates it can disrupt your metabolic rate and lead to the 
uh, leads to the formation of body fat. Dietary fiber is important both for maintenance of proper digestive flow through the intestines and also uh, limiting the amount of fat dissolved in your blood. Sugars are shown because they overconsumption of sugar has been shown to negatively impact the your risk for heart disease and diabetes. Uh, protein is shown because deficiency of protein can cause significant difficulty for people in developing countries and, and at-risk communities because they don't ha give their body enough material to rebuild itself. And then vitamin A and vitamin C are actually two nutrients which until recently have been required on Nutrition Facts labels, but the most recent iteration of the Nutrition Facts label has removed them as requirements and replaced them with vitamin D and potassium uh, because those are... Of, vitamin D is something that a lot of people don't get enough of, as well as potassium. One of the ways to help yourself with high blood pressure regard, with relation to high sodium is to con consume more potassium because it's the... Uh, it is the complementary ion in blood fluid balance. And then calcium and iron are both highly essential minerals that are important in bone and blood health. And just in a second, I'll show you here the, the new nutrition facts labeling. So... They have removed the calories from fat requirement because research has shown that the type of fat consumed is more important than the amount of fat consumed. Vitamin A and C are no longer required simply because most Americans get plenty of these in their diet nowadays. It was more of an issue back in the Depression and during World War II when there was a, no knowledge that, say, soldiers at sea needed to have vitamin C or their teeth would fall out. They've also added added sugars to the label because there's a difference between added sugars and naturally occurring sugars in the way that they're bound to the fibers. And we'll talk about all this in great detail when we discuss these various types of nutrition nutrients. Now, there are a number of different sections of the Nutrition Facts label. There's the section that has the serving size and servings per container at the top. And there's the calories and calories from fat section, uh, although the calories from fat section has been eliminated in the new label. Then there's the list of nutrients and the percent daily values, which we'll talk about what a daily value means. And then there are the footnotes that give you how all these values are calculated, and we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, a number of voluntary items on food labels, uh, calories from unsaturated fat, something called polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fat, which are two types of fat that are very good to get in your diet. Uh, stearic acid, which is another type of fat. Potassium is now required. Soluble fiber and insoluble fiber is a further distinction that you can make under the dietary fiber section and it can give you more information about how the types of fiber that you're getting are going to affect your, your body. Sugar alcohols are something that's used as an artificial sweetener and sometimes is shown in sports drinks or protein beverages when they're attempting to add sweetness without adding sugar. There are different types of carbohydrates that might also be listed and then there are other essential vitamins and minerals that could optionally be listed, especially on a supplemental item, which is trying to show you how many different nutrients are packed into it at once. Um, now here is an example of a nutrition facts label um, that we're going to go through and use in a number of examples. Um, and we'll refer back to this label from time to time. So one of the things that we talk about is something called precise kcals, or the exact number of calories in a food. Now, the number of calories listed on the label may or may not be exactly the same as the number of calories that you obtain when you add together the calories from all the different nutrients. Uh, now, we can 
check this on our own to find out. So on this label, for instance, if we see that we have 280 calories per serving in this food, we also see that there are 13 grams of fat, there are 31 grams of carbohydrates, and there are 5 grams of protein. The way that you find the total exact calories in this is by adding the calories from each nutrient together based on the knowledge that there are 4 calories per gram of carbohydrates and protein and 9 calories per gram of total fat. So in this case, 13 times 9 plus 31 times 4 plus 5 times 4 is equal to 261 calories. So in this case, they've actually overestimated the number of calories in their food. So, serving sizes are designed to reflect the amount of food that people actually eat and are intended to be consistent across product lines so that people can compare foods to each other and to determine which one might be better. Generally, these are stated in both U.S. and metric measures for the maximum amount of communicability, and the... the these listed daily values that you see in the grams of each nutrient are listed per serving, not per container. So it's important to remember that because sometimes you might find that you have doubled or tripled the amount of fat you were intending to get by eating the whole pint of ice cream instead of one cup. So the... Amount per serving of things like fat uh, can be used to figure out the percentage of fat in the food. Um, this food specifically has 120 calories from fat, and so 120 calories per 280 calories is a 43% fat food. And despite the fact that the type of fat is more important than the amount of fat, something that's 43% fat is probably quite unhealthy. This, I think, is something like ice cream. So when we talk about total fat, we're referring to fat that includes saturated fat, which is mandatory to list, and also things called polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats. These are two types of unsaturated fat that occur in plant-based fats like oils and are generally considered to be good for cardiovascular health. Trans fats have recently been discovered to be incredibly bad for you, and as of 2006, they're required to be listed on food labels. Um, you should, in general, try to get as few of these as possible. They're the types of fats that come in uh, packaged baked goods and deep-fried foods. Total carbohydrates can include any starches, as well as dietary fiber, which is mandatory, and sugar, which are also referred to as simple carbohydrates, which are mandatory. And then sugar alcohols or polyols are often listed because in addition to being used as sweeteners and having calories in them, they can also cause gastrointestinal distress. And so trying to eliminate these things from your diet might help with things like IBS. Protein you might notice on labels that they don't have a percent of daily value or a percent daily value for protein. Uh, this is because it can vary widely among individuals, despite the fact that in general you need between 50 and 65 grams per, of protein per day. People with higher or lower activity levels or people who are ill might need significantly more protein than others. Now, the daily value that I've been talking about is a nutrient standard that's based on that's used on food labels in grocery stores and on restaurant menus, which attempts to summarize all of the science 
that has been done to determine how much of each nutrient we need. And we've generally discovered that almost everybody needs a diet that's composed of approximately 10% protein, 60% carbohydrates, and 30 or less percent fat. And these percentages are used to calculate the number of grams that you see on the bottom of the Nutrition Facts label for the daily value of these nutrients, and they're also used to establish the percentages that are listed along the right side. Now, this label section is not on all packaging. It's only on packaging that's large enough to accommodate it. Um, we'll take a look at that in a second. We can actually check the math on these percentages ourselves by using this guide. Um, so here's the, the label. And you can see down here, it says that for a 2,000 calorie diet, you want to get less than 65 grams of fat. And for a 2,500 calorie diet, you want to get less than 80 grams of fat. For saturated fat, you want less than 20 grams and that's within this 65 grams because you want less than a certain percentage of your total fat to be saturated fat, 25 for a 2,500-calorie diet. Cholesterol, you want less than 300 milligrams of for each of these diets. Sodium, less than 2,400 milligrams. Total, total carbohydrates, you need 300 grams for a 2,000-calorie diet and 25 grams of fiber. Um, so we can check that math here we know that you for a 2000 calorie diet uh, we want 60 percent of it to be carbohydrates so 60 percent of 2000 is 1200 kilocalories and then if you divide by four kilocalories per gram for carbohydrates you get 300 grams of carbohydrates um, and that's what it says on the label for the 2000 calorie diet column you can do the same thing for fat, but if you do it based on 30%, you'll get 66.6 grams, and the number listed is only 65. Protein is not listed, but if you do the math, it's 50 grams. So the values for the daily values are based on research, most of which was done in the 1960s. Um, but it's not just because it's done in the 1960s, and it's not still valid. The human race has not changed much in that time. So the review of these is that you need less than 30% of your calories per day to come from fat, which ends up being between 65 and 80 grams, because most people don't fall outside of the range of the 2,000 to 2,500 calorie diet. A very small percentage may fall above or below that, especially if you're highly active. You might go even higher than 3,000 calories a day in your needs, but and some very small individuals might need less than 2,000 calories a day, but not too much less. Carbohydrates, if you get 60% of your calories from carbohydrates, that's 300 to 375 grams. Um, low carb diets, uh, we will talk about why those are bad for you, um, because most, if not all of your energy should be coming from carbohydrates. If you don't get enough, you'll start consuming the protein from your body while you build more and more body fat in an attempt to mitigate starvation. And many people think that you need a lot more protein than you actually need. 10% of your calories for the day it ends up being 50 to 60 grams of protein, which is quite easy to get if you eat even half as much meat as most Americans. So the percent daily values are printed on the right hand side of the label of the nutrition facts label. And the summary of how they're calculated is printed in the box at the bottom of the label. The fat content of the label that we've been using is 20%. Uh, there's 13 grams of fat and you need 65, so you divide 13 by 65 to get, and multiply by 100 to get 20%. And 
I found this handy reference from the FDA website. This is contained within a document I've posted to the Blackboard uh, called the Food Labeling Guide from the FDA. This is the daily value for all of the essential nutrients that we're going to talk about in this class. So you see here, they say 65 grams for fat, 20 grams for saturated fat, and on down the list for all of these that we have, some of which we've talked about and some of which we have yet to talk about. Uh, this will be the gold standard for all of the daily values in this class. Whenever I ask you for a daily value, this is where you'll go. I've also included this specific diagram in image format on the Blackboard page. Here's another example. So the daily value for calcium is 1,000 milligrams based on this, which shows calcium being 1,000 milligrams. How many milligrams of calcium would you get from one serving of this food? So if we go to the nutrition facts label, and we go down to the section for vitamins and minerals, which is below the second heavy black line, we see calcium is listed as being 15% of our daily value. So if we have 15% of our daily value, the daily value is 1,000, so we multiply 1,000 by 15%, or 0.15, which gives us 150 milligrams of calcium. Here's another example. Do the precise kilocalories listed here match the labeling of nutrients that we have? So it says that there are 240 calories in this food. Um, and we can see that they state that they have 10 grams of total fat. They have 27 grams of total carbohydrates and 13 grams of protein. So if you multiply 10 by 9 kilocalories per gram plus... 27 times 4 kilocalories per gram plus 13 times 4 kilocalories per gram, we get 250 calories. So these people have underreported the number of calories in their food. Now, one last thing I'm going to talk about today in terms of food labeling is the organic labeling that you might see all over the place. This is a U.S. Department of Agricultural agriculture distinction. Uh, it indicates that for a food to be labeled organic, it must be produced without hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, or genetic modification. And something that is 100% organic means that it cannot have anything, any part of it fail to meet these criteria. And then things some things can still be listed as organic as long as at least 95% of them has parts that can fit this criteria. And then sometimes something will say made with organic ingredients. That it means that it generally has to be about 77% organic ingredients. Um, you, we will talk in this class about reasons why this may or may not be a good choice for things to consume um, compared to standard conventional products. Um, in general, there's a lot of hype about genetic modification and uh, synthetic fertilizers. There is a certain amount of validity to that. However, there are also myths about some of it, and we will attempt to lift the veil on those things in this class. In terms of the stickers on your produce, you can determine whether something is conventional, organic, or genetically modified by looking at the labeling on the UPC code. So if you have a four-digit code beginning with a four or a three, um, this is a conventional piece of produce. Uh, say 4011 would be a conventionally grown banana. Now, if you won't have that same banana, but it's organic, there will be a five-digit number beginning with a nine uh, so the same banana, which was organic, would be 94011. And then genetically engineered products would have five digits beginning with an eight instead. So something 
Uh, a good example of something that's genetically engineered but is actually very good is basmati rice, which is a fast-growing and easy-to-digest strain of rice, which also happens to contain a much higher nutrient density than other types of rice. And it grows in half the time. So it's making a huge impact in the developing world where hunger is a big issue. But uh, that is it for the first lecture. Next time we're going to start talking about the human digestive system and the direct route from food to nutrition. And then we're going to jump into our discussion of the micro, the various macronutrients and micronutrients that will be important for the understanding of the rest of the course where we'll talk about applications of this information. So thanks for tuning in and have a good week. I'll be posting a quiz on this lecture very soon.